Hey guys, it's Adam from Lucipixel and welcome back. Now before I get started today, I want to set the tone. And by tone, I want to let you know where I'm coming from in sharing this story with you. So the first thing I want to say is, I'm not entirely convinced that what I'm sharing with you today is actually true. There is a very good chance that I'm completely wrong and that the coincidences, as specific as they are, are just coincidences. This happened a really long time ago. I was quite shocked when I experienced this, but coincidences happen. The second thing is, I'm not accusing anybody of anything. I'm not pointing fingers. I'm not going to name names. I'm just going to share the facts with you. You can light up the comments below as much as you want with what you believe I'm sharing with you, but I'm not going to point fingers at anybody because my intention is not to share a complaint. It's not to accuse. It's to share with you an incredibly valuable lesson that I learned in my life that resonated into every business, every idea I pursued from that point forward in my career. It transformed my perspective on my own work and one which I share with you and with my students every day. So let me get started. When I was in my or mid to late twenties, I was a new father at a little girl in my life who was a couple of years old at the time, Emily, uh, who was the center of my universe. She was who I looked at and observed and drew and was inspired by every single day. So needless to say, a little girl was born not only in the real world, but in my sketchbook as well, a little character named Emily. And I filled my sketchbook with drawings of her doing all of the millions of complicated things that little girls do at that time. And at the same time, there was a character I had been developing for a little while named Zygmunt, who is named after my old Polish grandfather, who, as he had been described to me, because he died the year before I was born, was a very serious, tall, very deep-voiced old Polish grandfather who didn't have a lot of tolerance for many people at all, except for maybe my older sister, Angie. The rest of them could all fly a kite, but Angie, he loved. <laughs> so I, I had these very kind of funny stories of my grandfather growing up and Emily. So I decided to start slowly forge this story, to start to fashion the story about this old, and pay attention, old Slavic scientist who had very big ambitions to become a world famous scientist who would create something that would take the world by storm. And he locked himself away in his, ca in his very, very excessively tall castle, way up on the top floor in his laboratory, and went on about his scientist things. But one day, due to some tragic event in his family, he was approached by members of his family saying that the parents of this little girl named Emily had unfortunately passed away and he was the next of kin. So he was put in charge of taking care of this little girl and was handed this child, essentially. Now, being a very private, very meticulous scientist who was used to being alone, having this little girl walking around in his studio, knocking things over and getting into things she wasn't supposed to and leaving things lying around on the floor and not respecting the quiet time he needed to concentrate, he got quite annoyed with her very quickly. So on an impulsive whim decides to go and visit this, this child psychologist slash child therapist named Claire Vanya. And um, she sits down, he sits down with her and they have this session together, so to speak, and he can see Zygmunt can start to see that there's something a little bit questionable about the motives of the social worker. Her questioning, her attitude was very off putting to him. So he decides to take Emily with him and head back home. But Clairvania decides not to let go of this. 
and decides she's going to take it upon herself to try to get Emily away from him. Try to try to try to pull Emily away from that for from that because she deems him it is not being a very fit environment for a young child and be, starts to intrude on their lives together. And through this conflict, he starts to develop a bit of a protective attitude towards her. And as time passes, decides that he really starting to to care for her. He really starts to f- take on a more parental role in her life and starts to want to keep her. But the antagonist becomes this social worker that does everything in her power to get this child away from him. And I'm going to leave it there. The story goes on. It wasn't a hugely evolved story. I only really came up with this kind of quick summary on what I wanted the story to be about. I produced a three, four minute traditionally animated uh, uh, short animated clip that I did in Flash, mostly of just a mad scientist climbing up a flight of stairs, really. And I had drawn out and wrote up this quick synopsis on what I what I wanted the story to be. And one day I found myself sitting down in a studio with a studio director pitching this idea. Again, not hugely valuing my idea. I really didn't expect anything substantial to come of it. But sure enough, I pitched this idea to a studio. And when I sat down with her, the the head of the studio said she thought it was a really good idea and said, if you'd like, I can, if you can produce some kind of a synopsis, it's what they call a a Bible, right? A a story Bible where essentially you have character designs and a synopsis of the story and the long version of the story as well, and some character sheets and et cetera, et cetera, maybe a little short animated clip, which I had at the time. And she said under NDA, non-disclosure agreement, meaning she's got to keep her mouth shut about it. Um, she would pitch this to different studios and see if she could get some kind of support, some kind of financial backing and help to make this a reality. And although she showed her enthusiasm for it, and although, you know, that's a cool concept, I really never thought anything would come of it. It was just a stupid idea I had mulling around in, in my sketchbook. I never gave it much value. So I signed an NDA with her, but it was a finite NDA. I think the contract was for four to five years or something like that. So that means she had to keep her mouth shut about it. And I was protected under NDA for that period of time, which I thought was plenty enough time for her to pitch different studios and get back to me about it. And so she did. And I handed her this Bible with all the details and pretty much forgot about it at that point. She never called me back. I never heard back from her and I never pursued it. I went on to other things. I worked at different studios. I started working in video games, all these different types of things. And it disappeared from my peripheral until some time later, maybe a decade later. It's hard. I, again, I suck at dates, but maybe around a decade or so later, I'm sitting down in my living room and I see a trailer the first time I see a trailer for a new movie. And in that movie, it's a story about some old Slavic scientist that gets saddled with somebody, I won't say who, because I don't want to be too specific about it, somebody who needs to take care of a couple of kids and doesn't want to because they're a disruption. And then a social worker comes into the picture and tries to get these children away from him. And he develops an affection for them. And this social worker ends up becoming a real disruption in his life because he wants to be a mad scientist and produce, you know, some world famous invention and these kids are in the way. But at the same time, he, he cares for them and they become an important part of his life, so on and so forth. Now, of course, unless you've been living under a rock for any length of time, you probably know exactly what I'm talking about, don't you? But like I said, I'll let you say it in the comments below. I don't want to say it myself. I don't want to incriminate myself, so to speak. Now, when I saw this trailer for the first time, my heart sunk and I felt a very sick feeling in the pit of my stomach because, well, for starters, my gut instinct was my idea was stolen. And that feels terrible, doesn't it? 
But that's not the main reason why I felt terrible. It wasn't theft that made me feel sick. It was the fact that whether or not this was stolen, that my stupid little sketchbook idea was good enough to become a multi-million dollar blockbuster hit with multiple sequels and probably enough merch to, to finance feeding all of the third world countries on this planet for the next 35 years. It was a huge hit and it was almost identical to my idea. Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. That's completely irrelevant. I realized that although I had a great idea, I squandered it. Although I had an idea that was clearly valuable enough to become a blockbuster hit, I took it for granted. I gave it away. And had I had a little bit more business sense, I could have made something of it. I could have been the one to develop it into something big. But I didn't. I let it go. And I learned a very valuable lesson. I realized that I might have taken my idea for granted, but somebody with the business sense, somebody who had access to resources, didn't. And they had the sense to take that idea and develop it, nurture it into something substantial, extremely substantial. And I vowed never to take an idea for granted for that day forward. And any business pursuit, one of which just off the top of my head, I don't know, starting an online school. I decided not to take that one for granted either. And here we are five years later, full-time online school that I founded years ago. I did not take that idea for granted. I nurtured it. I developed it into something substantial. It was just an idea, just like the idea you might have be, you might have sitting in the back of your head right now. But I didn't squander it. I developed it into something that did have value to it. But I could have just as easily discarded it. Just like I did the thousands of drawings that I didn't think had any value sitting in the back of my sketchbook. I'm going to share something with you. And this is at the foundation of who I am as a teacher. I consider my skill as a teacher not in my ability to point out what people are bad at or pick out people's flaws and tell them how to fix it. It's actually quite the opposite. I find that more often than not, my true value as a teacher is in recognizing people's strengths, realizing people's value, when in most cases, they don't. And I make a point of looking at people's work and although they might be lacking certain areas technically or where they might be lacking certain things uh, uh, narratively, I look at the work and I say, there's a whole lot of potential in that if you keep nurturing that. I make a point of shining a flashlight on, on potential and saying, keep working on that. There's real potential there. You can grow that into something fantastic. And more often than not, they just kind of laugh me off and say, ha ha, yeah, thanks, that's very sweet, Adam, I appreciate it, it's a very nice thing to say. And they, they basically take it as me just trying to be, to offer some empty flattery and encouragement when 0% of the time I'm being superficial about it. I always mean it when I say it. And I say it with a hell of a lot of conviction because I need to drive home to this artist not to take their idea for granted the way I did. And that's what I'm telling you today. If you have an idea sitting in the back of your sketchbook right now that you've been mulling around with for a while, I don't know, months or years or whatever, it's just that comfortable fallback character that you draw every day, which we all have, by the way, right? We always have those fallback characters that we doodle when we're bored, when we don't know what, else, what, else, what the hell else to do. And what you're probably going to do is you're going to rip it up or you're going to take a post-it note and you're going to slap it on top of it and draw over it and try to make something better out of it. You're going to discard it and move on to something else. And you'll probably discard dozens of those ideas before you might settle on well, maybe one. And what I'm telling you to do here is go back into that trash can, uncrumple that idea and 
tape it back into your sketchbook. Because what you're doing is you're only tapping into the first ingredient to creating something great, and that is planting a seed. I've quoted Chuck Jones in the past many times in, in one of something he wrote in his book that resonated with me. He said, never underestimate the power of the spontaneous thought. We have countless fleeting spontaneous ideas that, that, that fly through our head on a regular basis that make us, us go, ha, yeah, that's a cool idea. And then we see something shiny and we turn around and walk away and forget about it. And what I'm telling you to do here is don't ever do that. I, I grab my cell phone every time I have an idea like that. Maybe it's an art talk like today. Maybe it's a character design. Maybe it's an idea for painting. Maybe it's an idea for a story. And I immediately grab my phone and I email myself that idea because it's quick and accessible. And emails are something I know I'm going to read. Notes in the notes app generally tend to ignore and I might forget about them, but emails I never forget because as soon as I get back home and I open up my emails, it pops back up and reminds me. Whenever I'm trying to tap into ideas or trying to uh, uh, remember what it is I wanted to do an art talk or design about, I just filter through my emails and I look for the ones and I have keywords that let me know what it is that I was trying to remind myself of and I grab back into it. And I'll usually leave a little note to say this was, I title it as the idea and then inside the, in the email itself, I give a quick paragraph or two describing what it was that inspired me. You know, maybe source material, a link to the material that, that inspired me or just a little bit of a, rem a little bit of a reminder on what that whole story was about so that I remember what it was that got me interested in the first place. And then comes ingredient number two, nurture it. An idea is a seed, but you need to plant it. You need to water it and you need to wait. You need to develop it. Look at any animated film you've ever showed some TV series like the Simpsons or family guy or Ren and Stimpy or anything. Any long-running animated series. Look at any long-running uh, live-action series, some sitcom, some comedy, some drama. Go back to the early, early, early episodes, and you'll notice how shitty they are in comparison to what they ended up becoming 10 years later. Look at The Simpsons. The early first kind of pitch episodes that they did were horrible compared to what they are today. But what you're looking at today is a manifestation of audience feedback, character development, artists that got more and more familiar with the artistic style, understanding which characters grab more than others. Like The Simpsons originally was all based around Bart. But as time passed, they realized that a lot more people were connecting emotionally to Homer. So the show started to revolve more and more around Homer as time passed. That was through audience feedback. Who people spoke about and what resonated with the audience. You need to do the same thing. Develop it, nurture it, water it, and most importantly, be freaking patient. Take your time. These things take time. But as you do, you're going to realize that this silly little faceless idea you had is going to become something incredibly meaningful to you. Like a child, when they're first born, all babies come out looking a bit funny looking, right? But then after the, a few weeks pass, the trauma from birth starts to go away and they start to get their, their face starts to show up and then their eye color pops in and then... As a few year, more years pass, they really start to become, you start to see their looks and their personality starts to emerge. And then they become six-year-olds and then they become 10-year-olds. And you can see you're getting glimpses of what they're going to look like when they're an adult. And then they turn 18 and you see them as young adults. And then they get older and you start to see experience, more and more experience seep into them. And they start to become more and more professional about things. And you realize that this little weird looking baby became an incredibly rich person. They became an incredibly deep and thoughtful and compassionate and professional and impressive adult. And every phase of their life is something worth cherishing that just keeps growing and becoming more and more special as every year's year passes. Well, that's what it means to be an artist. It's that you can take something from your imagination and nurture it and develop it over such a period of time and put so much thought and energy into it that it becomes real to you. It develops a life of its own. 
Everything you've ever seen on a TV screen is a manifestation of a spontaneous thought. That's your gift. Your gift is the spontaneous thought. Your responsibility is not to squander it. Remember that to be a successful artist requires more than just the ability to create and to draw. You need to have a little bit of business sense. And please, do not confuse business sense with being political or being some shrewd, corrupt bureaucrat, <laughs> some politician. No, I mean somebody who understands the value of not letting a good idea slip through your fingers. And there's no better example that I can think of than the artist Bobby Chu. Somebody who started off as just being a teacher. Well, not just a teacher. He was a teacher in probably one of Canada's most reputable animation schools, Sheridan College. I know, being a Canadian, it's a very reputable college. And he went on from there and he started developing a name for himself online and started his started doing chew streams where he would, much like I'm doing right now, he would share his thoughts and feelings about the industry. He'd worked on many different projects on the side and books. Some things kicked off more than others. And he started to develop a little bit of a name for himself and started the sketch group where he, subway sketching, I think, or something like that, where he'd get a, he would organize these get togethers in Toronto where people would jump in trains and sketch together, started to become a little bit more of a recognizable figure in the artistic community. And those two streams started to grow. And then he got involved in a thing called sketchaholic, which was another kind of collaboration to get artists together and working together. He was always very involved in creating communities for artists and then he through that notoriety he was recognized by tim burton and he worked with him and who's now his wife Kay, Kay sidera and um he got recognized by by tim burton and worked on alice in wonderland alongside michael kutcher and he used that opportunity he didn't go thanks for the paycheck and go on with his life no he saw this as a as another another blossom on this plant, on this seedling. And he used that notoriety to reach out to other artists. And through reaching out to other artists, he started to interview them. And then he started to collaborate with them. And then he started schoolism and he started a school. And then through schoolism, he started to develop that into traveling worldwide and offering work workshops across the world. And oh, well, his legacy is quite vast at this point, but it all started with a single simple gesture and what i'm telling you is your mind is flowing with these ideas and you draw them on a sketchbook and then you pull out a post-it note and you slap it on top and you cover it up with something else you band-aid your idea or you throw it in the garbage and what i'm telling you is don't cherish it nurture it and realize that although you might take your own ideas for granted somebody with a little bit more business sense, somebody who's a little bit more clever and a little bit more resourceful isn't. And they will turn your silly little idea into a blockbuster hit one day and you're going to kick yourself for not thinking of it first. And you deserve that notoriety. You deserve that fame. Just don't throw it away before it has a chance to happen. All right? So... Thank you very much for joining me today, as always. And thank you to all of you amazing people who've been reaching out to me. I've been getting quite a few messages and comments, just sharing a lot of affection and sharing, sharing a, lot of, a lot of commonalities with me and just showing a lot of appreciation for the content that I'm producing. So uh, my love goes out to you as well. And thank you for that. It's very encouraging to me. And of course, I love you all with all my heart and... Happy painting. Take care.